seven biggest mistakes the world will make in the end times. Number one, accepting the beast and his mark. The Old Testament contains 15 books of prophecy, while the New Testament has only one, Revelation. The Apostle John wrote Revelation while he was in Ephesus, where he and Mary, the mother of Jesus, spent the rest of their lives. Revelation was written towards the end of the first century. During that time, Emperor Domitian required everyone to burn incense to Caesar once a year on the Lord's Day. People had to stand before an altar, raise their hands, and declare, Caesar is Lord. For the early Christian communities, this was a significant challenge. Their faith was clear, Jesus is Lord. They could not say Caesar is Lord without facing severe consequences. It was now essential to see if the Christians would stay firm in their faith. People have been dying for their faith even before the creation of this book. The book serves as the guide for those who are willing to die for what they believe. John wrote down what he saw and heard, and sometimes what he saw was so extraordinary that the angel had to remind him 11 times to write it all down. The book of Revelation covers the events that occur before, during, and after the return of the Lord Jesus. What is the mark of the beast? We all have specific numbers that stand out to us. This number could be your favorite athlete or your date of birth. However, a certain number found in Revelation has intrigued many people for many years. And this is the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast appears in Revelation. The mark of the beast is referred to as the mark of the beast because it is brought into being by a man who is referred to as the beast. Revelation is full of graphical language. Through the continued use of symbols, we can visualize what would otherwise be ungraspable. It cannot be too strongly emphasized that this is intended to help our understanding, not hinder it. So many individuals have used the highly symbolic nature of the book of Revelation to neglect or even dismiss its instruction as if the symbols are too vague to convey a clear message. That is entirely not the case. Six seals and six trumpets are over. The very last series of disasters is about to happen. It will be the worst for the world. Evil powers will gain a tighter grip on society than ever before, though their hold is about to be broken. In this section, three individuals come together to form an alliance with the goal of ruling the world. Among them is a being of angelic origin and nature referred to as the Great Dragon and Ancient Serpent, commonly known as Satan or the Devil. The other two are human in origin and nature, beasts, otherwise known as the Antichrist and the False Prophet. Together they form a kind of unholy trinity in a ghastly mimicry of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Revelation 13, 1-3 And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been fatally wounded, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. His rise to power will be subtle, initially going unnoticed even by those closest to the action. He will emerge from the common populace. According to John in biblical imagery, the sea represents the general mass of humanity, or more specifically, the Gentile nations. Despite the horrors of the tribulation, it will never be beyond God's control. Satan is restrained by a leash held by God. Satan re-enters the narrative during the Troubles for the first time since the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. As the seals and trumpets unleash their burden on the earth, Satan has been in heaven. The two beasts appear in chapter 13. The primary figure is a political leader, a world dictator who wields totalitarian control over all known ethnic groups. He is the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, who acknowledges no higher law than his own will, claims divinity, and demands worship. The beast is a human individual who accepts the satanic offer that Jesus refused. But he is also anti-Christian in the broader sense of that prefix. He has the power to make war against the saints and to overcome them. His characteristics are those of other fierce beasts, leopard, bear, and lion, human or divine. He seems to arise from a federation of political rulers. 
gaining the world's attention through an astonishing recovery from a fatal wound, presumably in an attempted assassination. His blasphemous egotism is broadcast for 42 months. His position is bolstered by the Second Beast, a religious colleague with supernatural power who focuses the world's worship on his superior. His miracles will deceive the nations as he commands fire to fall down from the sky and images of the dictator to speak. His appearance will be like a lamb, a young sheep with only two horns. According to the Bible passages in Revelation 16:2 and 19:20, the mark of the beast is a symbol that distinguishes those who worship the beast out of the sea. Revelation 16:2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and loathsome and malignant sores came on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Revelation shows us the economic strategy of the first beast and the second beast. Revelation 13, 16 through 17. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. And he decrees that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. He causes all to receive a mark. A mark will be given to everyone under the government of the beast and his associate. This mark is necessary to participate in the economy, and those without it will not be able to buy or sell anything. Only those bearing a special number on a visible part of their body, hand or forehead, will be allowed to trade, and the number will only be marked on those who engage in imperial idolatry. The number 666 is the coded name of the dictator. We have already discussed its meaning, the nature of apocalyptic writing. Until he arrives, when his identity with this figure will be only too obvious. All attempts to decode it are useless speculation. One thing is clear, he will fall short of perfection seven in every regard. The ancient Greek word charagma refers to a mark, which some interpret as a symbolic mark. However, it's not commonly associated with people. Nevertheless, the idea of a physical mark being necessary for buying or selling is not impossible and could be practical. The technology to provide people with a mark enabling them to participate in the electronic economy is available. There are various ways this could be implemented, and such programs are constantly being proposed and tested. The notion of a mark on the right hand or forehead is seen as a satanic imitation of something God will do, as Satan is not a creative being and can only imitate God. It is considered an imitation of God's mark upon his people. Revelation 7, 3-4 saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we seal, mark, the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard how many were sealed, a hundred and forty-four thousand, twelve thousand sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. The number of his name. This was a common concept in the ancient world. In Greek, and Hebrew as well, letters were assigned a numerical value such as A equaling 1, B equaling 2, and so forth. The Antichrist is described as a man whose appearance was greater than his brothers. He will be extremely irresistible to the masses due to his charismatic personality, speaking abilities, and outstanding good looks. The Apostle John adds to Daniel's account of the Antichrist's blasphemous activities by stating that everyone alive will be required to worship him. Throughout the final three and a half years of the tribulation, the Antichrist will embody Satan himself. According to 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. The Antichrist, referred to as a beast in Revelation 13.1-8, will transition from being a regional leader to a global tyrant and eventually to a deity. The Number of the Beast Revelation 13.18, Amplified Bible here is wisdom. Let the person who has enough insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the imperfect number of a man, and his number is 666. The use of numbers as symbols is quite common. The book of Revelation contains numerous instances of the number 7, which appears in connection with stars, lampstands, lamps, seals, trumpets, and bowls. It is considered the perfect number in the Bible, symbolizing completeness. The number 12 is associated with the tribes of the old people of God, 
and the apostles of the new, while 24 combines them. The number 1000 is the largest and 66 is the most attention-grabbing. Comprised of sixes, it symbolizes the inability of humans to achieve the completeness represented by the number 7. Here it serves as a clue to the identity of the last world dictator before Jesus reigns for a thousand years, also known as a millennium in Latin. Is it significant that 666 is the total of all the Roman numerals except one? However, attempting to identify him based on this figure will be fruitless until his physical presence makes it very evident. Using this method, many candidates for Antichrist have been suggested, such as Napoleon, Mussolini, Stalin, and so forth. The term Mark has no special biblical usage apart from its association with the beast. The Greek term chiragma was most commonly used for imprints on documents or coins. Chiragma is well attested to have been an imperial seal of the Roman Empire used on official documents during the 1st and 2nd centuries. In addition to its use in Revelation, the term chiragma appears only once in the New Testament, specifically in Acts 17.29, where it refers to an artistic image. Acts 17.29 Therefore, since we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and thought. The more common term for mark or brand is stigma in its noun and verb forms. What is the identity of the Antichrist? How will we be able to identify him? During the tribulation, one man, the Antichrist, will come up to unite the world under one authority, according to the Bible. Like his father, the devil, this worldwide tyrant will disguise himself as an angel of light, but will eventually act in accordance with his true evil nature. Here are six answers to questions about this future sign of the apocalypse. Who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is someone who opposes Christ. Anti can also mean instead of, and both meanings apply to this coming world leader. At the same time, he will openly oppose Christ while posing as Christ. The Antichrist will do all in his power to live up to his dreadful moniker. As Satan leads the world's forces into the Battle of Armageddon, he will persecute, torture, and kill God's people. He will be the most powerful tyrant the world has ever known, dwarfing the likes of Caesar and Hitler. When he comes on the scene, people will flock to him like flies to honey, and they will do anything he asks. How will he unite the nations? The prophet Daniel describes the Antichrist in these terms. Daniel 7, 7-8 After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the great root. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. As Daniel predicts, the next world leader will be known for his or her eloquence, which will attract the world's attention and administration. Daniel goes on to tell us that not only will this golden-tongued orator speak in high-blown terms, but he will also speak arrogantly against God. The Apostle John describes him similarly in the book of Revelation. The beast was given a mouth to speak arrogant and blasphemous words and authority to act for 42 months. Revelation 13.5 A mouth was given to him speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Who will worship the Antichrist? According to Revelation 13.8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Based on Daniel 7.25, the Antichrist is depicted as a cult leader. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. He will speak out against the true God of heaven. The language used suggests that he will try to elevate himself to the level of God and make declarations from that position. According to 2 Thessalonians 2.4, the Antichrist opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He will seek to receive worship from the people of the world. 
Does the Mark of the Beast exist today? The Mark of the Beast mentioned in Revelation 13 has led many to wonder whether it will be a high-tech tattoo or part of a billionaire's plan. However, the Bible is clear about what the mark is and when it will appear. Firstly, there is a specific timing requirement for the mark. The scriptures indicate that the mark of the beast will only appear at a particular time and place in history, and as of now, we have not reached that time or place. The reason it is called the mark of the beast is because it is associated with a man referred to as the beast. This means that the mark will be brought into existence by this individual. Therefore, until the Antichrist is ruling the entire earth, there can be no mark. According to the Bible, the beast and his mark will not appear on earth until the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. As a result, the mark cannot exist in any form prior to the tribulation. Therefore, any suggestion that a mark of the beast exists today in any form is merely a forewarning. Number 2. Eliminating the Two Witnesses The Two Witnesses A description of two people who will assist in carrying out the work that God has for them to do during the time of the tribulation can be found in Revelation 11, 3-12. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for twelve hundred and sixty days, forty-two months, three and one-half years, dressed in sackcloth. These witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands which stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. Revelation 11, 3-5 At the end, there will be two witnesses who will prophesy in the city of Jerusalem. There is a sense of impending disaster in the spectacular appearance of these two mighty. Between the sixth and seven trumpets, attention is focused on the human channels through which the divine revelations are communicated. The key word in both chapters is prophecy. Revelation 10.11 Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. The verse reads, My Two Witnesses. This introduces two more interesting characters of Revelation, the Two Witnesses. The nature of their ministry is prophetic, as evidenced by the fact that they will prophesy. They preach and display repentance as seen by their wearing sackcloth, and they have an effective ministry as we read, I will give power. The two witnesses indeed served with power. Such power, in fact, that they can witness for 1260 days despite the world's antagonism. We also read, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. God has given the two witnesses special protection similar to Elijah. All of the nouns used to refer to the two witnesses in this passage are masculine in ancient Greek grammar. The two witnesses are two men. The two witnesses in the book of Revelation will have miraculous powers to accompany their message, and no one will be able to stop them in their work. Revelation 11.6 These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. The two witnesses will have miraculous power, but they will be killed when their testimony is concluded. The wicked world will rejoice, allowing the bodies of the fallen prophets to lie in the streets. Revelation 11, 7 through 10. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make a war with them and will overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie on the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For from the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days, and will not allow their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who live on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who lived on the earth and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The term as Sodom speaks of immorality, and the term as Egypt speaks of oppression and slavery. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another. The earth saw and triumphed over the deaths of these two witnesses. 
It is possible that the fact that people see this of all peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations is an indirect foreshadowing of how current mass media works. It is incredible and not far-fetched at all to think of a live worldwide broadcast on new channels and over the internet and see the fantastic scene described here. The preaching of these two witnesses and their call to repentance was a torment for many because they could not stand to hear the truth while they loved their lie. Their bodies will lie in the streets for just over three days, while the transnational mass, tormented in conscience by their expressions, gloat over and celebrate the removal. When the two are resurrected in full view of everyone, the relief will turn to terror. Their ascension will be triggered by a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. The Reviving of the Two Witnesses Revelation 11, 11 through 12 And after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. Because the earth was unworthy of these two witnesses, God simply summoned them, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. We read the phrase, come up here. The earth was not worthy of these two witnesses, so God simply called them home, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. It is clear that the masses always fail to listen to the prophets of God. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake. An earthquake brings judgment and inspires many to praise God. However, it remains to be seen whether this will result in genuine repentance leading to salvation. When the people leave the city, a strong earthquake will have already destroyed one-tenth of the buildings there and slain 7,000 of the city's inhabitants. It is impossible to ignore the startling similarities between the deaths of these two witnesses and that of Jesus. It will be impossible to avoid thinking about the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ that took place. Number 3. Cursing God After the Judgments After the judgments on the world, the world curses God. The first four of the seven seals open, releasing what are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, because the judgments appear metaphorically as a horse and rider, leaving destruction in their path. The fifth seal. The fifth seal of the scroll indicates those who would be martyred throughout the tribulation for their trust in Christ. The sixth seal. When the Lamb of God breaks the sixth seal, a great earthquake strikes, inflicting massive destruction and extraordinary astronomical phenomena. The sun goes black, the moon changes blood red, and the heavens recede like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was displaced from its place. The Seventh Seal The judgments that led up to the end of the tribulation are now evident in the scroll, and they are so harsh that all of heaven falls silent. The seventh seal clearly heralds the start of the next round of judgments, as John instantly sees seven angels holding seven trumpets ready to blow. An eighth angel takes a censer and burns much incense in it, indicating God's people's petitions. When the seven seal judgments are completed, the second phase of the tribulation, which includes the seven trumpet judgments, will begin. In Revelation 8-9, through John describes a time near the end of the world when angels sound seven trumpets. Each trumpet heralds the arrival of a new round of judgment on the people of the earth. The seven trumpets are described in Revelation chapters 8 and 9, as well as in Revelation 11, 15 through 19. The trumpets represent disasters. During the chaos, it's natural to wonder how humanity reacted. Ideally, one would hope for repentance or an acknowledgement of the divine hand at work. However, even as massive hailstones fell from the sky, the human spirit remained stubborn. Instead of seeking forgiveness or understanding, the people cursed God. Revelation 16.21, New American Standard Bible And huge hailstones, weighing about a talent each, came down from heaven upon people, and people blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because the hailstone plague was extremely severe. Their hearts hardened by years of rebellion, couldn't grasp the magnitude of their error. Thus, the seventh bowl wasn't merely a demonstration of God's power, but a clear indication of human frailty and the consequences of persistent defiance. The story serves as a somber reminder that while God is patient and merciful, there comes a time when justice must prevail. 
The book of Revelation talks about the world's ending and God's final plan. With each bowl poured out, the urgency and gravity of God's judgment becomes clearer. The purpose of the described events is not to cause fear, but rather to emphasize the significant consequences of a society that rejects its creator. The story features God's wrath. The judgments serve as a profound testament to God's righteous indignation against the wickedness and rebellion of humanity. As each bowl is poured out, the earth experiences unprecedented calamities, from painful sores afflicting people Revelation 16, 2, to the sun scorching the earth with intense heat Revelation 16, 8. It's crucial to understand why these events are significant. According to the Bible, they're like puzzle pieces that fit into a larger picture. These occurrences are part of God's grand plan, which serves as a reminder that God is in control of everything. Gracious and loving God, we come before you today with hearts open and minds ready to receive your word. We seek understanding, wisdom, and guidance as we delve into the sacred texts of the Bible. Help us, Lord to approach your word with humility, recognizing that it holds the keys to life, truth, and salvation. Lord, we ask for clarity as we study your word. Help us to grasp its meaning and significance in our lives. May your Holy Spirit illuminate the scriptures for us, revealing the deep truths contained within its pages. Give us discernment to understand the context in which each passage was written and guide us in applying its teachings to our daily lives. Grant us, O God, the ability to see beyond the surface of the text. Help us to uncover the layers of symbolism, metaphor, and historical context that enrich the message of your word. As we read, May we be inspired by the stories of faith, courage, and redemption found throughout the Bible. Lord, we pray for a spirit of humility and openness as we engage with your word. Keep us from pride and arrogance, and instead, cultivate in us a teachable spirit. Help us to listen attentively to your voice speaking to us through the scriptures and to be receptive to the lessons you have for us. We lift up to you, O Lord, all those who struggle to understand the Bible. Whether they are new believers, seekers, or those who have been studying your word for years, we ask for your guidance and grace. Help them to overcome any obstacles or confusion they may face and lead them into a deeper relationship with you through the study of your word. May the study of your word not be merely an academic exercise, but a transformational experience. As we encounter your truth, may it penetrate our hearts and minds, shaping us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to live out the principles and values we find in the Bible so that our lives may be a reflection of your love and grace to the world around us. Finally, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for speaking to us through the pages of the Bible and for revealing yourself to us in its pages. May we never take for granted the privilege we have to study and learn from your word. May it be a lamp under our feet and a light under our path as we journey through this life. We offer this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>